question. In your heart, in your soul. How you, goes soul? Either, <laughs> both. Are you French, Polish, something else? In my soul, I'm French. In my heart, I'm Polish, I think. Why is that? Because heart uh, somehow is connected with sentiment more than the soul, I would say. And since I grew up in Poland, my childhood, my, my youth, my schooling, film school above all, uh, it's Poland, so naturally my heart goes to, to Poland. But your sentiment is... But uh, my soul, uh, France was always something I, I aspired to because when we are hermetically locked by the communism in, in Poland, we all dreamt of going west and going to various places depending on the individual. Me was France. I loved French movie. I loved Paris because I heard of it from my parents. You know, it was something that I always imagined. You know, and you want to, uh, you want to, you, you want your imagination to become the reality. So, my first steps were Paris. You went back to Krakow. Yeah, I was in Krakow two days ago. Yesterday, I was yeah. there. What was it like for you? Oh, it was fantastic. Um, but each time I go there, I'm, I moved. Uh, it's a question of nostalgia. Uh, there's literally uh, every corner, every building that reminds me of something. It would seem to me it would remind you of everything because that's where you were with your parents. <clears throat> that's where I was with my parents. That's where I lived in the ghetto. That's where I escaped from the ghetto. That's why I returned. That's why I went to school. That's why I had my first success as a child actor, and uh, that's I, where I suffered, when I had my joys of, you know, mm -hmm. of my uh, growing up. So obviously, I'm, my heart's there, as I told you. Tell me about your mother. Well, my mother was taken to, uh, to Auschwitz very early from in one of the first ra raids of the ghetto, and that was it. I never heard from her. Mm. I was hoping for her to return. My father returned after war, but uh, mother didn't. What happened to you? I lived in a country with Polish peasants, very primitive um, cottage. It was virtually medieval, but the people were very good. They saved your life? They saved my life, yeah, absolutely. Did you understand what had happened to your mother? I know. What do you mean, do I understand? Did, did they say when she didn't come back, she was gassed? I had to she was gassed in a in Yeah, a, in that, a this I learned later from people who knew her, who were more or less in the same transport, etc. At the beginning, uh, I, I didn't know. But I wanted to tell you what happened. Right after the war, I didn't know what happened to my parents. And then when I was staying with uncles, a little note came. People were returning from concentration camps, from labor camps, etc. It was a note from my father. So I knew he was alive. And he returned. And uh, then I was told that my, my mother will not come back, that she was dead. So I learned about her death about two or three months after the war. How old were you? I was 12, just 12. I know you're not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but what does that do? And how do you think that might be reflected? I, I, I can't answer this question. The kids accept life as it is because they don't know anything else. They have no, they, they can relate to any other lives, you know. So now when I have children, I relive, relive it uh, uh, in a strange way because very often I think of myself and of my parents. Um, uh, I can somehow, um, Imagine them in the same situation, and imagine myself in the, in the skin of my father during those times. Mm -hmm. But then, that's, it was it. I tell you, the hardship of, uh, through which I went uh, was, uh, seemed quite normal to me. What was painful was the separation from the parents. Mm -hmm. That was really something that hurt most, 
more than anything else, more the, than the hunger, than cold, or whatever. Not to have your parents there with you. Yeah, to know, to knowing that they've Where been they taken, were. waiting, you know, mm -hmm. walking, playing in the, in the fields, in the snow, and just... I remember one day when I saw a man walking towards it. For some reason, I saw that silhouette, and I thought it was my father coming. And he was coming closer and closer and closer, and finally he was close enough to realize that it was just a, a peasant walking. You know. mm -hmm. w when did you say, I want to be a, I want to be in the movies. I want to be an actor or a director. Or I <clears throat> knew I wanted to make movies. I knew I wanted to be a part of it. I I, I knew I wanted to create this because uh, it, it was fantasy. It was fantasy. It was very early. I mean, literally as a child. Projection was something magical. It's in itself. Uh, you see, I remember when I went. I've, I went to the school only for a, a few weeks because the war started and there were no more schools for Jews. But in the school, they have um, um, a, a, a pediascope. You know what it is? It's a it's a projector that projects books. You see, mm. you put the book and it has a mirror and a, and a mm. lens in front on the screen. And that thing was fascinating me, you know, and I was interested in how it worked. And I was always trying to build projectors. This was uh, my hobby, through even when I was in the country. Can you tell me uh, just how all of this shaped you? This experience. Of this Krakow? I can't tell you. I can't tell you only the episodes of my life of those times. But what you, it did to me. You can't look me, back I and can't. say there is a direct connection between that, losing my mother, experiencing this sense of, of, of fear and, and all that you just described and know how it's manifest in the man you are. Well, don't, don't you agree that whatever we live, whatever we, we experience results in our activity, in, you know, in our passions, in loves? me as etc so obviously it must have but to what extent yeah. I'm unable to tell you I would rather it's a work for for a psychiatrist or uh, I know but you're an insightful man I mean you think about these kinds of things don't never. you? never never absolutely never I'm not even interested in it you're not you're not no. interested in what shapes a life I'm interested in shapes the life of a thing of the world around me and my mm. own shape you know it's mm. just uh, it is said that they done away in Chinatown was some way this, your, your, part of it was your image of your mother. Well, it was about those times, <clears throat> and uh, I remember how my mother <clears throat> made up what was fashionable, etc. And I <clears throat> told Faye how I wanted her to look, and I remember that the Cupid bow was very fashionable, and I remember her makeup doing it exactly like this. I remember that it was fashionable to pluck the uh, eyebrows and then draw the line. And we made tests, and uh, Faye was delighted with it. I mean, but it there's no need to look for some kind of uh, deep meaning in it. It was simply that film takes place in the 30s, late 30s. And I remembered my mother in late 30s. Obviously, uh, I had the knowledge of what a woman should look like, but there is no association between the character and my If my someone mother. said, for example, that, as someone liked to speculate, Roman has loved women so much because he lost his mother, you would say, silly. There are other people who, uh, who didn't lose mothers, like Warren Beatty, for example, <laughs> who loved women as much as I did. So how do you answer to this one? It's because he didn't. Lose mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you just say that doesn't ring true to me. How did you get to Paris? It was much later. Uh, in, in those times, you couldn't even dream about leaving Poland. It was you know, like, like the wall in Germany. No one was allowed a passport. No one was allowed to leave. I had my sister, who from the concentration camp from Auschwitz, went back to Paris, you know. Paris was really her, 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 her place. She, she lived there before. She was older than me. She got married after war, and I learned that she's alive and that she lives in Paris, and we're corresponding. 
she was inviting me to come. She could not understand that I can't come. And then great changes happened in Poland, and I finally got my passport. That was my first visit of this town. And it was fabulous. You cannot imagine what it means, what it meant for someone who lived in that gray, drab, communist uh, reality uh, to visit a, 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 a Western city, a Paris above all. But I was still at the film school, so I returned. Is it Lotz Film School? Yeah, that's right, Lotz. Yeah, Lotz. Mm -hmm. And you had a chance to make a movie there, a short, right? Well, I did my first short films at the school, of course, at film well, So already you're becoming a director. I always wanted to be a director. When I was in this theater, I wanted to be a director, but the, uh, the film school was such an exclusive institution that I wouldn't even have dreamt then uh, to be accepted in this school. So I thought I'll study acting. However, I was not accepted to any acting school. So, um, and I, I spoke to uh, the dean of the, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, film school, and he said, why don't you try to the film school? I said, what chances do you have? He says, you won't know whether you have or not chances if you don't try. So I tried and I got to the film, in the film school. That was one of the most... Uh, Turning points in your fantastic life. Fantastic days of my life when I read my name on the, <laughs> on the list. And that's how it all that started. That you've been accepted. Yeah. Let me just talk about the movies you've made. You moved to Paris permanently, what, 60, 61? Uh, yes, I moved to Paris permanently after my first uh, feature film, The Knife in the Water. I went back to Poland to do this film, and uh, uh, the film was very badly received, <clears throat> first by the government, uh, because of its content, um, lukewarm by the press, and pretty well by the public. First went to Venice Film Festival and won uh, the um, critic prize there, then uh, was shown at the uh, uh, New York Film Festival and had a cover of Time magazine, then was nominated for the Academy Awards. Knife so in the Water won the cover of Time magazine? Yeah, it was on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, the title on the, on the cover is Lovers in Polish Film. It's a close-up of two characters, the girl and the boy kissing on the yard in a very, very big close -up. Suggesting change in Poland or something? Suggesting that there are films also in Poland. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it was poorly received in Poland by the official. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, Gomuka, who was then yeah, all right. had, through a, a, an ashtray at the tele television. The and, prime minister of Poland. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Then Repulsion came along. Uh, um, an American producer of Polish origin, Jean Gitaski, suggested that I come to London and make a film there. And uh, he uh, introduced me to several production companies, and one of them, on the make, you know, there were uh, distributors and, and producers who uh, needed respectability. They did sort of uh, almost skin flakes, but n not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they won. So he was, was that young director acclaimed by the press and and crit critics. So they. Uh, were willing, willing to, to, to finance me, and I needed quickly to write something that would uh, be uh, up there early. And we, with Gerard Brush, my uh, friend with whom I wrote many scripts here in France that never, uh, uh, never seen the light of a projector, uh, wrote the treatment of, of repulsion, and they liked that. We tried to make it really. Uh, horror and uh, cheap. Was it easy to get Catherine Deneuve? Oh, it was very easy to get Catherine Deneuve because she knew me and uh, I was appreciated as a young uh, film director with, with future. So <laughs> Catherine liked the role and she, she came to do it right away. She was a beginner herself. That what do you of think of her? What do I think of her in, as, as an, an actress? actress? Well, um, She's uh, sometimes great. I think she's better with age like this. Way. May I have some more wine? Yes, apropos? please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I liked her performance in Repulsion. I think it was a very good experience for both of us. Uh, she was very receptive to all my directions. It was like, like dancing a tango with her, truly. 
Dancing and, a tango? Yeah. She's following your lead? She was following my lead, yeah. yeah. And then Rosemary's Baby. Then came, no, after that came Cul de Sac. Yeah, forgot And that. then came The Vampire Killers. Forgot that. And then came Rosemary's Baby, yeah. yeah. But Rosemary's Baby really put you on the map. Yeah, indeed, because it was my first studio picture. And uh, then it was Mia, with whom was another tango. Mia was fantastic <laughs> to work with. She was really great. Because? She was just a, she's a talented actress, and she loved the role, and she lo loved the film, and she was very flexible, and she would listen to, to, to me as a director and follow my instructions. What can I tell you more? You were about how old at this time? Sharon's I was 27 when I did, uh, uh, when I did um, my Paul first feature, yeah. no, A Knife in the Water. So mm. that must have been like f four or five years later. After Rosemary's Baby, which was 68, then in 69, you were in Rome when the Manson murder took place? No, I was in London, actually. I was in London. You've talked about this before, and, and I don't want to go into it at length, but it just... I'll be very grateful. <clears throat> because how painful it is? Um, without a reason, <laughs> that can be. Yeah. It's something that's, you know, the past, and I don't think of it anymore that much. Have you talked to your children about it? Did they know? No, no, of course not. Mm. What's the point? Here's one point. A man has the most, <clears throat> the most awful tragedy come to his life. Wife, an unborn child brutally murdered, and you survive and over the next four or five years, survive, come to grips with it, and make what many people consider to be a American classic, Chinatown. And you think about your life, and you think mm -hmm. about what we talked about earlier. <clears throat> Mother, Holocaust, Poland, then this, and, and yet you survive, you keep your sanity. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> it had to do something to you, though. Yeah. Well, as I said already earlier, I, in, my, in my opinion, everything does something to you. It's what is human um, mind, if not the accumulation of experiences, daily experiences, like layers and layers of them. Whatever you do is a result of it. It shows somehow for a psychiatrist that can even show in your doodles you do when you, uh, uh, as you telephone. Film making it so much more complex requires so much more of you, so you can consider it, you can consider movies as some kind of uh, an X-ray of your of the director's mind or soul. Uh, even if he tries to hide, he can't because it's him. You know, even if it's it's a very f banal, uh, mundane movie, the director shows through. So, if I want to know the mind and of of you and understand you. I should lock myself up somewhere and watch your movies, and I will It's not that you. simple. It's not that simple. You have to have a know-how. You know, if you just watch it uh, as Charlie Rose, you may just enjoy the movie in this. <laughs> yeah. But if I look at it with some considered viewpoint, I would understand. Probably, or maybe you would. Uh, or at least it's uh, there to understand. I may not get it, but it's there to understand. It's there, of course. I think whatever uh, man creates, it's there to, 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 uh, to be understood. Whether it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the today's uh, documentary or ancient scriptures or whatever, there's a man behind it, you know, and it depends 
how uh, good analyst you are to, to get the, uh, the essence out of it. Why do you think Chinatown was such a great movie? I, I, I haven't got a clue. You come on. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> It's that's one of the classic films of the last yeah, 30 years. Yeah, but it's years. not a question for me. I made another movie. Not a question. As you far mean, as I'm concerned, it was another movie. It's the best movie you've ever made by far. Mm. Not, nothing else is close. I think it's uh, this um, uh, estimation is relative. Uh, whoever looks at the movie gets his thing out of it. And although a lot of people consider it such, you will find others who prefer something else. Do you prefer something else? I don't think I made my movie yet. I don't have one that would give me a real satisfaction. I would not put any one of them on my gravestone. So what's keeping you uh, what's keeping from me? making the movie that's your best movie? Or hasn't made his it's best movie? It's a question of, of choice of the subject. I have not found a theme yet close enough, uh, um, relevant enough, uh, and worthy enough. Uh, one day I find it. Maybe my next movie will be it. It's possible, you know, I hope. But is this a passion for you? Are you obsessed by this? Do you I'm obsessed. Care? I'm obsessed by every movie I make because once I start working on it, I get so involved that it, 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 it boards the obsession. Filmmaking is my, uh, my toy, you know. This is my miniature electric train. And once I'm on the set playing with it, uh, nothing uh, can distract me. So uh, it's not that, it's just that I have to um, uh, find something that um, um, gives me the same um, source of enthusiasm and at the same time is meaningful enough to be um, to be uh, presented as, as, as something worthy, because it's not only the question of um, the way you tell it, but what you're saying that is important. You know. I can tell a story. I know that the te technique uh, is no problem anymore for me. You know. So what's the problem? The problem is the subject, I'm telling you. The problem is what are you talking about? How will you find the subject? Well, for example, that subject seems to me close to it, and I hope... The pianist? You know, pia the pianist, yeah. yeah. I hope that this is going to be it. I don't know to what extent, but at, th at this moment, I'm really completely involved with it. I think that it, it says things of extreme importance, particularly today, uh, after all those years where people began to f forget that these things really existed, where there is a, re a reoccurrence of, uh, um, of the ideology that led to this human tragedy. Um, the human tragedy of, of, of the Holocaust. The Holocaust and Nazism. Of the whole war, you know, not only the Holocaust, of what happened. That's why he said the word tragedy rather than mm. Holocaust, because Holocaust limits it somehow. Uh, you know, but it, it was a tragedy, tragedy of the, 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 it was a global tragedy. The Ninth Gate, a film that opens in New York. Mm -hmm. Did you think that could be the film? I mean, you had... Uh... No, I thought it was a film which would be fun to make. Uh, it's a type of subject that I enjoy very much. It's, it's my cup of tea. It's something that it's, uh, can give me an opportunity to um, show my um, profession at its most, or at most. Um, the story of a, of, of a man who is, finds lost volumes of books in search of two books about the devil. No, it's really a, a story of a character who is a, um, a book expert and who is a mercenary and who is uh, entrusted with, with, with the book that's supposed to have some kind of supernatural qualities, him being uh, uh, completely materialistic, uh, sees the, uh, some, another prophet in it and doesn't believe in, in what other believe, uh, ha this, in the qualities that other believes this book has. But as he goes through his research, 
things occur that make him change his, his mind. Here is a clip from that film. I don't trust anyone. Coming? Watch with the wing. Yeah, I'll tell him there's something. But he's about to open up the greatest evil of all. What have you got for me? More than I bargained for. I'm interested in what makes you tick. I'm interested in... I know you are, but why, I'm not. Why you've made the choice... Well, I, it's not your <laughs> program. I'm interested in why you've made the choices you have. I'm interested in why with uh, you... Um, haven't made a deal to come back to the United States, where you've got lots of friends and lots of people, and where clearly the Hollywood community would welcome you. Why not? That has nothing to do with instinct. Well, that has to do with reality. One, one major reason that I would become immediately prey of the media, and For, you know, then I, I don't think I could go through all the at this, this at your sentence. age or what? At, yeah, but the, the, inevitably I would have to spend some time here until the things are cleared, whatever uh, way it would go, and I, I can't even figure myself being surrounded by. Uh, um, prurient journalists and I'm not and, being and, prurient. And, and I hope you grant no, me that. No, I'm not talking about yeah. you. I don't think you would be uh, interested. Really, you are interested now, and I'm really proud of being interviewed by, by men like you. I, I'm not giving this type of interviews to other journalists, mm -hmm. but you are surrounded by your colleagues who are interested in other aspects of my life, and he would immediately jump jump upon the opportunity, if there's any, uh, any kind of notion, any kind of uh, uh, word about my returning, there's immediately some kind of article appearing in, in the tabloid one or two but or three. But what are you scared of? What can they write or say about you that scares you? It doesn't scare me, it's just oh, okay. very unpleasant. All right, but unpleasant is a fact of life. Well, I mean, maybe I, that's but a don't you try to uh, 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 avoid unpleasantness? Of course you do, but at some cost. Lots of people, including your friends, including people, as you said, the movie community is dictated by Hollywood, who believe that you would only be able to achieve your potential as a filmmaker, your profession and craft of choice, if you had been able to come back. And that was in your hands, not somebody else's hands, your hands. But I don't know, I didn't say I'm not going to do it. Believe me, there are other much more important aspects of my possible return it's, and, and than you think, than Hollywood and access to it and, and possibility of being at the peak as the people who you, you quoted believe. The most important for me would be to get over with. It's rather for the peace of my mind and any other reason that I would like to do it. I look across at you, mm -hmm. someone who is uh, all that you are, a talented, you know, a survivor, tough, uh, loving, and at the same time, this thing happened that caused you to flee the country, of which the person young woman involved is later said it was not what they said it was. It was one thing, but it was That's not the not other important. thing. Important but the important is that she is that they, says that she would like me to return exactly and get right. over with. She would like you to come and get it over with, but you are not doing it. You aren't. And I don't believe that you will, unless you can tell me that this is something you want to do. And that just is well, something you're willing to pay the price. And the fact that you're going to have to walk through a media maelstrom does not seem to me to be too high a mountain to climb. Tell me what you think. Well, I don't know. I think that I have, uh, you started with by, by um, interviewing me and asking me about my childhood and my youth. I was... Um, 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 I escaped from the ghetto. Um, I lived uh, uh, that way. Um, maybe, you know, the, as you said, it shaped my, uh, my personality. Maybe that's what I'm subconsciously looking for. Exile. <laughs> you know, I, I remember that one of the films that really... Uh, 
um, impressed me when I was a child. And I still consider it as a, one of the best movies I've ever seen. And a film w which maybe made me want to pursue this career more than anything else uh, was Odd Man Out. And there's something I'm, 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 uh, in me. I always lived out of my country, out of the place where I, sh where I should be. I always, you know, had something there which was threatening me and I'm not supposed to go. I always had some kind of nightmares, you know, thinking I went when I'm not supposed to be. Um, You're not saying to me, are you, that somehow this role of a fugitive is you're comfortable with and you like it. I mean, I have friends who say, I think of myself as an outlaw and I like that. Whether I like it or not, I don't know. I'm not a ma masochist, basically, but there's something no, you're more in of a it. Hedonist. I can only tell you that I live here, uh, I'm respected here, I'm happy here, I have family, I have children, and protecting my children at this stage of my life is the most important thing. I don't want to s subject them to uh, curiosity of the press. I don't want uh, to be all over um, uh, all over tabloids. I can tell you that mm, here in uh, France we have very strict uh, laws regarding privacy, and that even the paparazzi respected when I'm somewhere with my. Uh, children, like for example, at that uh, uh, Academy Fran uh, the Academy de Beaux Arts thing, I say, please don't photograph my daughter. They don't, and I, you know, I just okay, I work and I'm happy. Maybe we can get to something here. The Academy of Beaux Arts is one of the highest honors that can come to a Frenchman, a French woman in France. Uh, it is a select group of people. You were inducted in 1999? Yeah, the, the induction was now, but I was elected about a year and a half ago. It takes time to, to organize the induction because it's a big uh, event. Uh, it's the government that organizes it with God national drums and all. So I was inducted in, uh, um, about, uh, in December of the last year. So you seem to be saying <clears throat> two things. All my life, perhaps, I've been a fugitive. Mm -hmm. On the outside, looking in. Two, I have this rather very comfortable existence here. Not rather. Very comfortable existence. Very comfortable existence. I am honored in my place of residence, Paris, France. And for those of you who think that I should go through the fire, whatever it might be, in order to return to the United States, don't understand the toll it will take on my own psyche, but more importantly, on my new family, which came late in life for me, and my children. And whatever is at the other side of the river is not worth crossing. It's more or less this. Tell me what you tell your children when they grow up and say, Daddy, what, what happened in America that made them? Whatever I tell my, my, my children is always the truth. I have never lied to my children, not even about uh, Santa Claus and I never will. About uh, um, a year ago, no, there must have been two years ago, my daughter came to me and asked me straight in the face, uh, Daddy, does Santa Claus exist or is it the parents that buy the presents? I said, look, you're asking me like that, I, I can't lie to you. It's a, of course, it's parents, Santa Claus doesn't exist. It's a pity that you asking me this question because it's, it's a, a nice such a fantasy. beautiful fantasy, beautiful. She says, don't worry. She said, don't worry about, you know, she was like about five or something, four and a half. And then uh, she said, well, 
if it's not Santa Claus but the parents who buy the presents, why my rubber boots in f form of frogs were two sizes too small? <laughs> Santa Claus so. can make that mistake, but my parents shouldn't, <laughs> no. right? That's right. <laughs> Let me just stay no. with this, because it is, it is one of the defining... You've got to tell me, what will you say when they say, Daddy, did you rape a 13-year-old? Did you have sex with a 13-year-old? Did you do that with someone? When your daughter's 13 years old, if she comes to you and she's read this story... Well, somewhere. I'm not going to dwell on it, uh, Charlie. I tell you, I will tell them the truth, and truth is not what you say. So It's not what uh, I say. I don't yeah, say that. I'm right. not saying that. I'm so why do you, you imply that I would have to adhere to what the press or ma media say about it? And truly, look, I, uh, I did my time in prison, that was supposed to be it, and because the, uh, uh, the judge then uh, re reneged on the, uh, on the bargain plea that was accepted by all sides and wanted me to go back, uh, I left, and that's it. I won't go any further. And I understand that, and, and we add to that, though. I, I don't believe that. I believe what you say. Your wife says about you, the reason I love him so much in part is because I know he will always be there for me, I know he will never lie to me, I know he will always protect me. That could almost be what your children would say too. It's a nice thing, I'm glad she says things like that about me. <laughs> well. Maybe I'll have second thoughts after this interview. This really, yeah, after this no, are you serious? No, come on. I mean, no, I'm serious. No, serious. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. But you I just, know, it's, it's, it's not. So, you should not allow the fear of the media. You should be protective of your children, clearly, and that's your choice. Mm -hmm. That's your responsibility. But at the same time, you shouldn't. I know I hate to see that the fear of the media trial fire prevents someone from closing the circle and having an opportunity you know to stretch themselves well, without any limitations of any you, kind don't that you are there. realize that the media really took over the judicial system and in your country, that they really decide. In my case, it was clear. It was all because of the media. And the judge himself, he said, you know, at the one point, he said, they will, ha they will have what they, what, they, what they want, you know. Your head. No, no, they said, they, yeah, they, 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 you know, they wanted my head, yes, and they want my head. Look, it all started so long ago. It started on, <clears throat> after Rosemary's baby, after uh, Manson murders, there was a, a long period before they found the culprits where, you know, they were clearly uh, blaming one, the victims, for their own death, and me somehow being involved in it. it the absurdity of it was so uh, uh, awesome that they could uh, 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 su suggest by innuendos that it had to do something with black magic, uh, that there was a Ouija board found on the property, you know, yeah. a Ouija. Uh, just, uh, I, I remember my astonishment that I was all right with the press before that. My real problem started then with the murder, with the murder of Sharon Tate. And uh, they, 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 they won't let it go since it's just the story that will never go. It's all somehow mixed up with, the, uh, you know, with supernatural, with devil, with things. Why do you make so many films about the devil? I made two 30 years ago, Rosemary's Baby, and this one. My answer usually is, uh, what, which one are you talking about? You know, uh, Tess, or uh, Knife in the Water, or Chinatown, or Death and the Maiden? You know. It goes back to what we said. It's hard to make a good movie. It's very hard, very hard to make a movie, period. To make a good movie, it's really a question of luck, I would say. Why is it? 
Why is it so difficult to make a movie, or why yeah, is it movie. so difficult? Uh, it's it's tr it's a tremendously complex uh, form of art. It just doesn't depend on your uh, canvas and, and paint, paint and uh, colors and, uh, and and brushes. You know, you need an army around you. You need means of production. You you need all the hardware, and you need uh, what's difficult in it. I tell you. It's made of pieces, you see. And to maintain uh, this uh, uh, coherence between those pieces, it's so difficult. I don't know when I'm clear. When a, a director uh, uh, intends to make a movie, he's got uh, this movie in his mind. He's got the model of it in his head. And the making the movie consists of making that model available to the others because the imagination is not all. There are a lot of people who imagine beautifully, except nobody else knows that, he's, that they are imagining. Uh, directing is making this imagination physical, material. It's after all, after, at, at the end of the day, it's on a piece of film, on the raw reels of film. And when you start doing it, there are so many elements that, uh, uh, that uh, you are using, that you're getting um, further and further from that model that you have in your heart, because you meet the reality. First, it's the choice of, of, the, of, of the actors. You imagine certain characters. You're trying to be as close as possible, but there are other options that come across, which are not necessarily like the ones you had. An actor who is very popular, for example, at the moment, and the studio wants him, but he's not what you thought. Sometimes when you're lucky enough, you can be close to what you have imagined. There, are, there is a physical um, uh, 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 reality in which the scene will happen, like a room, and that room, even if you build it in the studio, even according to your to your instructions and plans is not exactly like the one you have imagined, etc., etc., masses of things. I personally try to concentrate daily and try to remember that first vision, that first concept which I liked so much, which I thought was so great as to make a movie, you know, uh, and see how it relates to this new... Uh, uh, um, reality which superimposes itself on my imagined uh, movie, you see? And I realize that it's not what it is. Closer I, I'm to it, better I'm off at the end. And sometimes I literally stand on the set, close my eyes and, and trying to, to remember how I was imagining that scene before the casting, before the arguing with the producers, before I, uh, talking about money, before uh, uh, hiring the actors, etc. And, and, and I, you know, sometimes it's like fleeting uh, uh, image, you know, but the, the bi bi bits and pieces are there. When you're doing the film, you don't, as everybody one knows, don't do it in continuity. You do it in pieces. You just do a little piece. And there are so many elements that distract you from the, the main line that when you put it all together, it's not what it's supposed to be. Russia's always look great, even in mediocre films. Everybody's always happy. The, the, the tragic moment, it's the rough cut when you put it all together for the first time. You know, usually the director goes to rest for a few few weeks, couple of weeks, and leaves it with the editor to put it all together. Sometimes he goes to, you know, to a clinic. Then he returns, then he, he sits, and the projection starts, and that is the moment when he wants to hang himself. Become, um, because almost inevitably it looks terrible, you see. With all my experience, I've been doing it for years and years, I know that the moment of the rough cut will be rougher than the rough cut itself, you see. So it's, that's why it's so difficult. It's difficult because it's a mosaic of things, you know, because you don't see the whole thing. The, you know, painter, when it stands, I went to the art school, I, I, I know how, what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to draft the whole thing first and then go to the details. This is the opposite. You start with the details and then you put it all together. Mm. That, that's... 
It's almost incomprehensible to me you can do that because it seems to me that you go from the forest to the trees rather than from the trees to the forest. That's exactly you know, what you it is. You have to have the overall concept. What do you regret about, if you're, if, if Polanski is about two things, love and work, yes? Your life and your passions. What do you regret? What would you change? What would you have done differently about your life? Mm, what would I have done differently about my life? I don't know. Maybe I should have been acting more. Acting? Yeah. Oh, come on. That's not what you believe. That's silly. You were born to I, direct. How can I I'm talking really about know your life, to, not about yeah. your passion for doing the movie, which is eloquent, eloquent in the way you describe it, looking at a piece of furniture and saying how you make yeah, it I know, is what but turns I you on. But I, you also make a life. Yeah, but that question, you know, I think deserves the answer I gave you, because how can you ask me what would I have done differently? Uh, life is the series of events. There is a, uh, you know, as Democritus said, everything in the universe is the fruit of chance and necessity. And life, it's exactly it, you know. It's something uh, between what you need and what is available, you see. In other words, uh, you can't always get what you want, as the Ro Rolling Stones sing. I mean, you going somewhere, you desire certain things, um, and you, of course, make mistakes on the way. I can't regret my mistakes. It would be silly. You just acknowledge them. I acknowledge my mistakes. It's great to see you in Paris. Uh, the Ninth Gate opens in New York and throughout America soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very interesting, stimulating moment, and I wish it could go on. Perhaps in the United States. Perhaps, perhaps. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.